Amen. The, the presence of the Lord will get you through. Praise the Lord. We have just a few announcements today. Uh, we have big things going on today. As you can see, we're going to have communion at the close of our uh, service today. And then we're having a church dinner today. Uh, amen. All are welcome. I think, I think everybody here knows that we're having a meal. Amen. Praise the Lord. And that will be to uh, honor, respect the ministry and leadership of Pastor Keith, his years here. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And then next Sunday, uh, missionary John Flood will be here. He is a missionary to the Native Americans. Amen. But today is Bill and Marilyn Malone's, Pastor Malone, Marilyn Malone's, their anniversary. I think it's 63. I'm not sure. It, it, I wrote that down in my prayer journal. It's been a while. <laughs> but maybe not to them. Amen. It might be like it was yesterday. Amen. Uh, well, let's open our service, the, this part of our service in prayer, and then we'll get into the word. Amen. Father, we thank you for this day. This is the day that you have made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And Father, we pray for the children as they're being ministered to in Children's Church. Lord, we pray for your anointing there. Father, we ask for your anointing upon the word of God here as it's being ministered, but also upon our hearts. Lord, do what you want to do, and that only you can do today through the preached word and, and whatever else you have in store for us today. We say amen to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Uh, today will be, uh, we'll be in all over the place, but uh, today I'd like to uh, give the next installment in a, in a teaching mini-series that Pastor Paul started a couple weeks ago on uh, the fivefold ministry. He preached a message a couple weeks ago on the gift and office of the apostle. Today I will try to cover the prophet and evangelist. And uh, I just want to say I'm probably not going to cover all the ground, but we'll cover, we'll cover some of the ground. Amen? So, amen. Let's, let's jump into it. So today we're going to look at Maybe just a quick review, purpose and goals for the fivefold ministry, and then the office of prophet and that of evangelist. Okay, uh, our key verse is um, Ephesians 4.11. I'm turning there as quick as I can. Which says, And he gave some to be apostles, this is God, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Okay, so let's look at the purpose and goals of the fivefold ministry just here in this short text, uh, verse 11 through, I believe it's 15. The purposes are to equip and to edify, equipping saints or equipping believers for the work of ministry. That's one of, one of the goals, or excuse me, one of the purposes for the different uh, ministry offices. And then also, number two, edifying the body of Christ. Edifying, building up the church. Okay, let's look at equipping. Uh, equipping means, uh, uh, King James says, perfecting. What does that mean? Uh, it is a process leading to being fully prepared. You are ready. So what, what are you ready to do? The work involved in the ministry. Being the kind of person God wants you to be, like Jesus. A grow, growing in that. Training and development in various ministry or service. This is not to be a sink or swim method. How many people have ever <laughs> experienced that in some... some uh, some part of your life. I remember me and my younger brother, an older brother, we went up to, I think it was Chase's Lake swimming, and my younger brother didn't know how to swim. So we took him out in a little deeper water, and then we let go. <laughs> and guess what he did? 
<laughs> he jumped on top of me. That's what he did. <laughs> so the sink or swim method, I'll, you know, you can learn something. It, probably the thing is you hope you never have to do that again. But uh, it, 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 is a, it is a method. It's probably not the best method. But it is a method where we can, we can learn some things. But then also working with or under someone uh, in, in a formal training, ministry service, or a task function. You know, I was talking with somebody maybe a week or so ago about, about these two different methods. God can use both. Um, I think we prefer having, having our, getting our feet wet a little bit before we jump in. <laughs> but either way, God uses them. Okay. Uh, e equipping uh, for the work of ministry. God has a ministry for you. God has a gift, or at least one gift, maybe several gifts for you to use in that ministry. Okay, and then also edifying the church. Edify, uh, here we go, here we go right here. O Oikidomia, remember oikos, you know oikos, the yogurt? That means house. I don't know why they call it house yogurt. Maybe it's like a house dressing. But anyway, uh, building a home. God is building a church. He wants to use you to help build the church. And so maybe that's why I spent too much time yesterday trying to build my chicken tractor. <laughs> my, little, my little outdoor shed for my little baby chicks to be in. Learning to build a house. Okay, either literally or figuratively. Uh, elsewhere where this word is used in the New Testament, it means promoting spiritual growth and character development, either through teaching or by example. So we learn, we learn to grow. And as we learn to grow, we become, uh, we help build the church. And also become uh, more mature. Okay, those are the purposes for the fivefold ministry apostle, prophet, uh, evangelist, pastor, and or teacher. Now let's look at the goals. They're, they're right here. Pastor Paul might have shared some of these a couple weeks ago. I, I, I don't remember all of it. I do remember some of it, though. Uh, the first goal is to bring people to a, it says, a perfect man in verse 13, but meaning mature. The measure to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, being Christ-like, that is the goal, to bring you, to bring the church to be like Jesus. Goal number two, to no longer be children or to no longer be childish. You know, we're to have the faith of a little child, but we're not to be childish in that. Uh, not, I, I put, not gullible, not uh, carried around, it says, by every wind of do doctrine, tossed to and fro. I remember watching, how many people remember Sky Angel? That's not in the too, too distant a future. We had that, and you know, that was great. But I remember one Sunday, they had two uh, different pastors on, boom, boom, one right behind the other. One, one said, oh yeah, there's a rapture, it's coming, you better be ready. And the next one says, no, there's not. <laughs> They're both Christian. You know, which is it? Well, we'll get into that a little bit later, but that idea of being tossed about, not, not being gullible, not believing everything, uh, not, not being unstable. God doesn't want us to be unstable. Not being fooled or tricked. These are one of the goals of, of the ministry offices. And so we won't be uh, tricked by men or the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, it says in verse 14. And then finally, and, and they're all maybe different ways of saying the same thing, growing up in Christ, in verse 15. Amen? We'll be that mature believer, that believer that uh, Liddell, Eric Liddell, and that when he died in the prisoner of war camp, the kids that he ministered to, hey, they told, hey, Jesus just died. To him, he was so much like the Lord. That's, that's who they thought he was. Well, you know, sort of. 
but becoming, growing up in the Lord. Okay, so with that as a background, uh, let's look at the office of prophet. And it says uh, in verse 11, and he gave some to be prophets. Uh, now, there, uh, 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 the, in the ministry office of prophet, there can be male prophets or there can be female prophets. This is an equal opportunity office. <laughs> there are different Greek words that uh, say that either gender uh, is acceptable. Okay, uh, speaking forth of the mind and or counsel of God. I remember the simplest definition I heard uh, is to, first of all, hear from God, and then to speak for God. Um, the declaration of that which cannot be known by natural means, meaning you're getting something from God. This is a gift. This is not something that you learn by reading a book. <laughs> I mean, you, you, you know, it, it, it's supernatural. Okay. Um, the Old Testament prophets mostly were in foretelling or predicting. It was one upon whom the Holy Spirit rested. The Holy Spirit came upon that. I, I put as an example uh, Elijah and Elisha, just a quick example. Uh, when uh, Elijah's last day, that was what it was, well, last day, as far as we know, um, he was caught up in a whirlwind and taken into heaven. His mantle fell to the earth. And Elisha picked up his mantle and smacked the Jordan River with it and said, where now is the Lord, the God of Elijah? And the prophet, when the water split in both directions, the sons of the prophets said, the spirit of Elijah is resting upon Elisha. And so they recognized that this Holy Spirit was now uh, hovering over Elijah, giving him a similar ministry that Elisha had. Also in the Old Testament, a prophet had to have an accurate descript, uh, prediction, but also, and more importantly, they had to have a God-honoring message. That is how they measured the prophet. In Deuteronomy chapter 13, there are two short sections on uh, how do we know who's, who was a prophet back then. Now, we're going to jump ahead into the New Testament, but we're honoring God. Um, Deuteronomy 13. We're getting there. I'd tell you a story, but that's slower than me getting there. Okay, it says, if there arises among you, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 13, uh, verse 1, among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder comes to pass, of which he spoke to you, saying, let us go after other gods, which you have not known, and let us serve them. Uh, Moses says, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. You shall serve him. Uh, okay. But that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has spoken in order to turn you away from the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, and so on. And so here, uh, they wanted to know, you know, when somebody has, gives up, in that, in that day, a prophecy, you know, what do we know? Well, first of all, to be from God, it had to come true, the prediction, but it ha a, they had to be serving the living God, Jesus, uh, or the, you know, Yahweh, the God. Uh, we, you know, because uh, other, there are um, genuine prophets. The Bible also talks about false prophets. And their goal is to lead you off the path from knowing God. Okay. Uh, oh, let me just turn the page to Deuteronomy chapter 18. 
Moses was maybe one of the greatest prophets of the Old Testament. But God told Moses in uh, chapter 18, of verse 18 of Deuteronomy, I will raise up a prophet like you from among their brethren, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. He's speaking about Jesus. And it shall be that whoever will not hear my words, which he speaks in my name, there it is, my, God saying, my words that the prophet will speak in my name. That's, that is the gift of prophecy. I will require it of, or the office of prophet operating. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. And if you say in your heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not happen or does not come to pass, that is the, same, the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. He, you shall not be afraid of him. Meaning, uh, he, he did not have the word of the Lord. He just thought that he did. Okay. Let's look at the New Testament because... Uh, Things changed. It wasn't just the Holy Spirit resting upon or hovering over. It was now um, an office ministry, a gift, the gift of prophecy. Let's look at that. The New Testament prophet, a telling forth of divine counsel, of grace, and also foretelling of the purposes of God in the future. I want to look at a couple of examples. Uh, the first example doesn't quite fit, but it is interesting because it brings in the idea of the, the true prophet with the true message of God being countered by the false prophet and his work. I want to turn to Acts chapter 13 to look at... Um, the ministry of... Paul and Barnabas. Acts chapter 13. Okay, now Paul at this time may not have been a prophet, but he, um, this is what it says in verse 1 of 13. Now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers. Barnabas, uh, he may not have been an apostle yet, but he was either a, either a prophet or a teacher. Barnabas and Simeon, who, were call, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manan, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. So those men listed there were either prophets and or teachers. Possibly Paul and Barnabas, Barnabas were prophets. They are preaching the word of God in verse 5. They had been sent out by the Holy Spirit. So that might have been his call to the apostleship. The apostle is the sent one. Amen. Meaning that one that's sent. And they were being sent out. They arrived in this city, Salamis, where they preached the word of God in the synagogue. And they also had John Mark as their assistant. Now, so they are preaching the word there. They're trying to minister to the governor who wanted, who wanted to be ministered to in verse 7. I want to hear about this Jesus. Paul, can you, and Barnabas, can you tell me about him? Well, uh, the proconsul or the governor of that area, he had somebody hanging around him who was a false prophet. The false prophet did not want this man to hear about Jesus. They were opposed by, uh, okay, uh, prophetes, that's the Greek word for prophet, pseudo, pseudo prophetes, that's false prophet, was trying to keep the governor from hearing and accepting Paul's message. 
They were foretelling, they were declaring the word. Now they're going to go from foretelling to foretelling. This is how they dealt with the false prophet. Uh, starting in verse 11. Paul is, well, <laughs> he calls them out in verse 10. Paul was filled with the Holy Spirit in verse 9 and looked right at him and said, O full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of a devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And now the hand of the Lord is upon you. You will not be able to see for a season. And they, it says a dark mist fell upon him and somebody had to lead him by the hand. And you know what? That really ministered to the governor. I want to hear more what this Paul has to say. <laughs> so there's this battle of the, of the real and the false and of knowing and respecting the real and rejecting the false. That's why I brought this, brought this in here. Uh, okay, Paul called out the false prophet. He described him in verse 10, and then in this case, prophesied judgment. I wanted to show the contrast between the false and the real. Now, genuine New Testament prophets. There was a man named Agabus. Uh, he, uh, not, a lot, not a lot said about any one particular prophet in the New Testament. There's a lot of things about um, apostles, a lot of things about pastors and teachers, uh, but not about these two gifts today, prophets and evangelists, not a lot is mentioned, and that's why I was hoping I'd draw pastor and teacher instead of <laughs> the draw that I got, the assignment I received today, but hopefully we'll, we'll all learn something. Okay, the genuine New Testament prophet, he comes on the scene in Acts chapter 11, in verse 27 through 30. Just a few short scriptures. In these scriptures, uh, they were at the city of uh, Antioch, which was the big church. They were first called Christians in Antioch. Uh, there were prophets that came from Jerusalem to Antioch. So the apostles and also some of the prophets were still located in Jerusalem. They came to Antioch. One of them named Agabus stood up and showed by the Spirit. However he did that, I don't know, that there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world. And it says, this also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. Okay, so he predicts there will be a worldwide famine. Uh, Every so often, this happens. This was God-made. This, this is not man-made, which we may experience uh, in the coming uh, years. But it says it actually happened. This happened. So is that, could he be a prophet? Yeah. If he has, if he has a corresponding faithful message about God, so, so what? Perhaps Agabus was led to disclose that so that the church could plan a relief ministry, which they did, similar to Convoy of Hope. They do that. I, you know, I don't know, but anyways, they did that. Hey, let's, let's send uh, relief packages down to the people in Jerusalem. So they, so they did that. And then much later... Um, Agabus shows up near the end of Paul's ministry. And we, we began to touch on this in Sunday school a little bit. We didn't talk about Agabus, but we did talk about the evangelist, who we're going to look at in a little bit, Philip. Um, Agabus predicts that Paul will be arrested in Jerusalem, which happened in Acts chapter 21. We're, I think we're staying in the book of Acts now. It won't take me that long to turn there. How would you like to have this? Agabus uh, comes to the home of Philip the Evangelist, whom also Paul and his ministry crew were at. And he takes Paul's belt off. I won't do that to any of you guys. And he ties 
Agabus ties his own hands and feet with that belt. He says, thus says the Holy Spirit, so will the Jews do in Jerusalem to the owner of this belt. And uh, that was was something that Paul, the Holy Spirit had been saying in every city, this is going to happen. Other people tried to, uh, when they heard this, they tried to get Paul, you probably shouldn't go. Don't go. But the Holy, the, the Holy Spirit, I believe, just wanted him to know this is going to happen. He didn't say, don't go. He didn't say, you got to go. Paul had it in his heart, I'm going. Nothing will dissuade me. And when, when, when he told them that, they quit saying, well, uh, God's will. God's will be done. And so this man had a track record of making predictions in the future, which happened. And it evidently had a good testimony because uh, he was able to continue ministering. And his ministry was accepted. Okay, so the prophet hears from God, receives a message from God, and then speaks forth from God. Uh, today, the pro- are there prophets today? I, I, think, I think all the ministries are t- for today. Amen? Praise the- That's what I feel. Some people like Fords. Some people like Chevys. You may agree with what I just said. You may not agree with what I just said. I'm going to heaven, and I, this is what I believe. And this, uh, therefore, this is what I'm preaching. There are prophets today. There are evangelists today. There are pastors and teachers today. And, uh, you know, I'm good with apostles, you know? If they're not, well, hey, they have a ministry. Amen. Uh, And so the prophet is to either declare the things of God or is given the ability to uh, declare things that will happen in the future. Okay, uh, and he gave son to be evangelist. Now, the evangelist uh, means the messenger of good, the messenger of good news. And what's the good news? The good news is about Jesus, amen? A, a preacher of the gospel, uh, the good news about Jesus. Uh, now, what I, I, according to Vine's dictionary, missionaries are evangelists. Amen. They tell people the good news about uh, about Jesus, but, uh, but they're not the only ones. There are evangelists. We have evangelists. Uh, we studied about an evangelist in Sunday school, uh, Philip. There is a growth and a progression in ministry. There, there can be. There perhaps should be. Philip started out with Stephen and five others just feeding uh, starving widows that were neglected. That's how he got his start in ministry. Then he became an evangelist. He started out, he first appeared as one of the seven deacons in Acts chapter 6, 5 in food ministry distribution. He did uh, stone soup. (laughs) That's how we look at it today. Uh, yeah, that, it, you can laugh now, Pam, but you, you, who knows where God will take you, amen? I'm here because of part of your ministry. I am. She asked me many years ago, I won't tell you how many, but I, I, can, I can do the math, if I wanted to come to a home Bible study, they were getting ready to start. And I pretended I didn't hear. I was busy watching whatever it was. Magnum P.I. That <laughs> tells you how long ago it was. <laughs> but I, at, at, when I went home, I said, yeah, I'll come. Amen? And God, God carried on from there. Okay, now, after persecution broke out in the church, they stopped uh, this ministry distribution, food distribution. Stephen was stoned. It says... The people were stoning Stephen to death, threw their coats to a young man named Saul, who would become known as Paul the Apostle. He was a young man. 
So Stephen was a young man. Philip was a young man. About 30 or 40 years later, they all come together in Philip's house in Caesarea for uh, the next appearing of uh, Philip the Evangelist. Uh, so, so Philip ran for his life down to um, Samaria, and there he did continue to do what he had been doing. He preached about Jesus. Amen. He preached about Christ. Acts chapter 8, verse 5. He ran for his life. He settled in uh, Samaria. He preached about Jesus. That, that's what he did. That's what he loved to do. That was his gifting. Not everybody has the gift of evangelism or the evangelist. It's an office, it's a ministry. It's a call, uh, study of different spiritual gifts. It's a gift of the church, but it's also one that's real helpful and wonderful for unbelievers, people, non-believers. Um, so Philip is down there um, in the Acts chapter 8. All four cardinal doctrines of the assemblies of God are taught or closely, pretty close in this chapter. Uh, Jesus heals. Uh, Jesus saves first. Jesus, first of all, Jesus saves. Uh, through the ministry of Philip, many people were saved. Many people, he did many miracles. Uh, many people were healed. Um, I, Savior. People uh, later through the ministry of Peter and John were baptized in the Holy Spirit after they had saving faith in Jesus. And then last of all, a kind of like a test run of the rapture happened. We're going to look at after uh, Philip baptizes the Ethiopian eunuch. He was transported perhaps 30 or 40 miles down the road uh, to a different city. Same word used for rapture, a catching away. The Holy Spirit caught him away, uh, yanked him right out of that water and put him down the road. And so we're going to experience that. So all four main teachings of the church cardinal doctrines are at least either declared or alluded to in this chapter. Okay. Uh, Philip's ministry was marked by miracles as well as leading people to Christ. Uh, deliverance, healing in verse 7. Great joy, it says there was great joy in that city. They were having a big tent revival. Amen? Which uh, I, any of us would love to have, uh, want to be a part of. You'd be happy if you saw people coming to Christ. You'd be happy if saw, you saw people being healed. Uh, people who, it says, were lame or paralyzed. You would be happy if you saw people no longer being tormented by demonic powers set in their right mind. You would be happy to see this happening, and you'd give glory to God. Amen, and we can. Evangelists, uh, and also they baptized many people. There were signs and miracles, signs pointing to Jesus. Evangelists can lead in revival, people getting saved, healed, delivered, bringing joy, bringing in a time of joy. Amen? And that happens. Not all the time. Could be all the time, but a lot of times it's not that way. But you know what's important? Casting out the net. And then waiting for the fish to decide, I want what's in that net. <laughs> Amen? Whether it's, hey, I'm sick in body, I need something. Or whether I need Jesus, I know I'm a sinner, I need him. Or whether it's, um, I need the Holy Spirit, I lack power. Amen. Praise the Lord. Are you hungry? That, that's what we're missing. That's what's missing. Where is the hunger of the people? Amen? And 
You know, people that don't have anything, they'll eat anything. <laughs> you haven't got anything to eat, I don't care what it is, just fill my belly or fill my soul if I realize I'm, I'm hungry and destitute. Amen. But it bought, brought great joy. All right, and then, uh, but Philip was asked to leave that city, Big Tent Revival, and to go out in the desert. Your ministry isn't done. Your ministry may take changes of direction or location, but you're not done. You're not done until you get called home. <laughs> Unless you abort your mission, and who wants to do that? Amen. But God is very graceful, uh, gracious, excuse me. Philip also ministered in a one on one evangelism as well as crowd evangelism. And he ministered to the Ethiopian eunuch all by himself, led him to a place of understanding who Jesus is and what Jesus did for that man through Isaiah 53. Philip, after baptizing the Ethiopian, as I said before, was caught away or raptured to Ezetus. Then moved, he moved to Caesarea. He preached his way to Caesarea on the Mediterranean coast, where he later entertained Paul's ministry group and Agabus the prophet, which I spoke of earlier. So, all, and so this is perhaps 30 or 40 years from when they started, when uh, Stephen was stoned. Probably didn't have good feelings about the apostle then. But all that changed because of the grace and mercy of God. God given gifts of grace and power. All of them. Whether it's the apostleship or the office of prophet, evangelist, pastor and teacher. They're all gifts given of grace and power. And the graces, they're gifts to the body of Christ. But God, is all, God doesn't mind sharing it with a lost world, amen? And so you out there, maybe perhaps listening by radio, uh, perhaps God has ministered to your heart. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. And Lord, we've, we've learned something about these offices of ministry, that of prophet, that of evangelist. And so, Lord, whether, whether perhaps we might feel more comfortable ministering to just one person, talking to one person about the Lord, or whether it's, hey, the, the more the, uh, a big group, whatever it is, Lord, we ask that you would use us. Amen, as, as you used Sister Pam many years ago. And Lord, so Lord, I just pray if there's any out there, either here in the house or out there listening through some kind of uh, communication means, Father, I pray that any that sense a hunger and a destituteness in their soul, that they, they know they're a sinner and they know they need Jesus. They need, they need God. Lord, I just ask that that person would open their heart to the Lord and invite Jesus in to forgive them of their sins and that they might ha experience great joy in their soul. We ask for your blessing in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Time to wake up. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. We're, we're going to move along now to uh, communion service. And I think you're leading that part. Amen. I'll, I'll vacate. <laughs> oh. Yeah, okay. As, just before we take the Lord's Supper, I want everybody to know, understand how, this, uh, how we do it here at Community Assembly. The only thing we ask is that you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior to, to partake of communion, okay? So those that do, as they get past, these guys will hand it out and give you what you need.
when Jesus had gathered all the disciples in the upper room, he uh, celebrated communion with them. And one of the things he said was, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Isn't that going to be a wonderful day? You know, our Savior will come back to visit us and we'll meet up with him all at once. And as they say, in the twinkling of an eye, and I don't know, I can blink pretty fast, but, you know. Um, so, the word says in Matthew 26, uh, 19, it says, And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this, as off, as actually off as you do this, you do so in remembrance of me. This is symbolic of what the Lord did for us when we celebrate. Father, I just want to thank you, Lord. I want to thank you for this house. I want to thank you for this people. But most of all, Lord, I want to thank you for your son, Jesus. What he did for us on the cross. The suffering that he must have gone through, Lord. I just want to thank you. Thank you for that. Go ahead and partake. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. I, I just, every time I think about that, that he went before us and did something that none of us can do. Yeah, you may lay our lives down for a friend, but it doesn't, it doesn't fathom as to what he's done. He gave his life that you would live. He gave his life that our sins would be forgiven. There's just no words to that. Father, I thank you for this cup, Lord. Lord, I thank you for your shed blood that we are healed, Lord God. That by doing so on the cross, Father, you gave us that choice and that chance to be with you always. A love that supersedes any love we have here on earth. Lord, I just thank you. I thank you again for each person here, Lord, and for the mercies that you expound upon us. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to thank you all for coming. There is a fellowship dinner and a card shower for Pastor Keith. He's dedicated many years to here, and I know I want him to dedicate many more. He's not done. I refuse to let him be done. Um, I'm going to grab him, take him. And we got a few locks we still have to fix down in Port Leiden. I got a call from our friend again. He broke the lock again. <laughs> so anyway, join us for fellowship supper. Don't worry if you didn't bring anything. You're still welcome to come. There's plenty of food. All right, Tom, would you bless the food?